Good evening, everyone. My name is Father Ken Sampson. I welcome all of those joining us in the greater Medford area, either as parishioners of Sacred Heart Catholic Church or our St. Joseph Mission in Jacksonville, or if you may be following us from other locations, we're in the midst of the high holy days of the church. And in the words of Catholic author Matthew Kelly, he said, as the Lenten journey came to an end, and as we entered this holy week on Palm Sunday, if you consider all the events that unfold in that eight day span from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, he said that every range of extreme human emotion is represented, that you could literally take any event of your own life, even if you've had a wild life of extremes, and you can find an analogy, emotionally speaking, to what you've probably experienced in your life, all contained in this week's journey. Um, most importantly, if we've done the work that we desired to do and set out to do for Lent, hopefully these days are joyful days for us. We want especially to focus on entering the sacred triduum with our whole hearts. That is the portion of the week represented by Holy Thursday, where the Eucharist is uh, established for the first time and where holy orders are established. Uh, Good Friday, where Jesus is crucified and dies on the cross for our sins. Holy Saturday, in which his body remains in the tomb while his soul descends to the dead to proclaim the good news and deliver the captives. And Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection. All of that uh, unfolds this week. And as I promised on Sunday, uh, I wanted to set out and create a series of videos for reflection for those of you who would not be able to physically join us. Last year at this time, sadly, a thing happened that I never believed would ever take place in the United States, in the history of the nation, let alone in my lifetime. That is, Holy Week was essentially canceled. I celebrated these high holy days by myself in isolation uh, to an empty church. It was very sobering and very surreal and made me very grateful uh, about our ability to worship and to gather to celebrate our faith. So this year, I'm looking forward to having you all back. But anyway, I have only one window to uh, create these videos, which is Tuesday evening. So um, I will give you some food, hopefully, to chew on. It won't be an exhaustive list, but I, as I said, I will make use of some of the things that are stored up here in my brain and some of the things that I learned more recently in the biblical conference that I participated in on Saturday. It was hosted by the Augustine Institute. It was an awesome experience. And the, the six videos that I'm posting, and hopefully you should see on the screen of our parish website, are, first of all, Palm Sunday, this one, which we'll dive into momentarily. The second one will be on Holy Thursday and the Last Supper, some of the details of that event that you may not be aware of. The third one will be on the Agony of the Garden and Judas's Betrayal. And the fourth one will be uh, Good Friday and the Passion of the Christ. The fifth will be on Holy Saturday, uh, three days in the tomb. And the last will be Easter Sunday and the Resurrection. So let's dive on in. We'll uh, begin with a little prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit. Help us to enter into these sacred times with our whole heart. Uh, help us to uh, have a deep appreciation, a spirit of gratitude for all that you accomplished for us on the cross as you won victory over our sin and over our death. Bless our loved ones. Bless all who will be on journey with us this week both near and far as we pray hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen palm sunday is the, the only reflection that i'm going to include here that was not a part of the biblical conference that i participated in just to let you know uh, however, I don't think a, a series of reflections on Holy Week would be complete unless we also took up the entry point of that feast. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had a chance to uh, experience Palm Sunday outside the United States, outside of the simple ways 
in most U.S. parishes that we try to simulate a procession, but I had a very memorable experience in my 20s that for me will always be um, my go-to image of Palm Sunday. Um, I was in the town of Medjugorje in Yugoslavia, which is now broken up into multiple countries, and I was there for Holy Week, and uh, it truly was a journey. I think we walked somewhere between three and five miles. We walked across the whole breadth of the town, but uh, something that really struck me uh, about it, especially the organic nature of it, because people just took garden clippers or tools or pocket knives or whatever they could uh, in a way that you would never see happen in the United States. But as we walked along the streets, people would just lean over people's fences into their gardens and clip off branches of shrubs or trees. And they were uh, carrying those branches as there was very much a joyful spirit in the air. I think that probably comes the closest I've ever, uh, I will ever experience in my lifetime to how things organically unfolded uh, in the time of Jesus with the fervor of the crowd and people rushing to throw garments on the ground and cut branches from the local palms to greet Jesus as the incoming Messiah, as a king, if you will. Um, this event that we celebrate on Palm Sunday is a short-lived triumph, of course, because just days later, people will turn on him and have him put to death in the most horrific and painful of ways known to people of that day. But at least for this moment, it's the apex of his popularity um, amongst the crowds. They want to physically crown him as their political king and ruler. Uh, I think many people are hoping this will bring in a new golden era, a new dynasty. Uh, the Jewish people, for the most part, were oppressed in their history. They were really a small geographical player, but you could probably point to two times in which that was not the case when uh, they, they outkicked the coverage, so to speak. Uh, one was in the time of David and Solomon, just two generations really, but that period is spoken of as the golden age of the Jews. And the second golden age, if there is such a thing, would be one that we read about in First and Second Maccabees when uh, the Maccabees were successful in leading a grassroots revolt to drive the Greek occupiers out of the Holy Land and reestablish uh, a royal line uh, and a new dynasty. And many of the people were hoping this Jesus would bring about a third such dynasty. So let's take a bit of a look at how this is described in Scripture. Um, this event is described in all four of the Gospels. So uh, if you're following along, if you have a Bible with you and you want to pause and read these accounts before going any further, you have that luxury watching this on video. Uh, the, the story appears in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. It's in the 21st chapter of Matthew. It's in the 19th chapter of Luke and the 11th chapter of Mark. I'm going to read the portion that comes from Luke and a portion from John because they give very different aspects of the event. Okay, so beginning with Luke, I'll read from chapter 19, verse 28, and I'll go just a bit past it to verse 44. This is what we read. And when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their garments on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. And as they rode along, they spread their garments on the road. 
as he was now drawing near at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will cast up a bank about you and surround you and hem you in on every side and dash you to the ground, you and your children within it. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. The second uh, version comes from John's Gospel, beginning in the start of chapter 12. I want to read a little bit of what proceeds immediately prior so that you can also include this unique detail in terms of the timeline that John helps us to understand. This is just days after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And this is what we read. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly ointment, a pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was to betray him said, Why was the ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take what he put into it. Jesus said, Let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus also to death, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, a great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that this had been written of him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see that you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. That's a pretty uh, striking description of the extreme emotional state of the crowd that his enemies, the, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, say the whole world is going after him. We can't stop it. And we, we know from this detail of John's gospel that at least a portion of the crowd, if not the entirety, are the same people who gathered by Lazarus's house to try and get a glimpse of Jesus and or Lazarus. Uh, because of this great sign that John reports, as I mentioned in previous weeks, uh, John only uh, takes the time to describe seven miracles, which he calls seven signs. They are for him enough of a list to show that 
Jesus is the one who completely fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. But according to the Jewish way of thinking of things, the seventh should be the greatest, the perfection, the most complete. And raising someone from the dead is that in John's mind. So the people uh, have come to believe, at, at least most of them. Some are in the crowd, clearly, uh, John says, to plot Jesus' death and Lazarus' death, but most of them have this fervor that Jesus is the Messiah. And ultimately, uh, that, that gives us a fuller picture. He's in Bethany. He's celebrating after that miracle uh, at a banquet held in Lazarus' honor that he's back among the living. And then without a lot of extra detail, just says after the banquet, which I'm sure went deep into the night, uh, they wake up at first light and they head for Jerusalem. And the assumption is that the crowd who are outside of the house, like paparazzi, they're following. They're saying, where is he going? He's riding on this donkey. Let's follow him and see what unfolds. And uh, probably they picked up more people along the way, pilgrims who have heard this story and are gathering. And as I mentioned uh, the other week, among them are Greek Jews from the diaspora who are just hearing about this for the first time, who are sort of outside the circle of information before the age of internet and newspapers and fast traveling news. They are just now hearing of it and they want to meet this Jesus. And uh, there's a building of fervor in the crowd. So that is the tone. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture and I apologize if there's glare. I'll just show it briefly. But this is an image. Let's see. There, I think that's about the best I can do under the circumstance. This is an image of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. So if you were actually looking yourself from this view, your back would be facing the top of the peak of the Mount of Olives. In my view, uh, as someone who grew up in the Rocky Mountains, it's a tall hill. I would not call it a mountain. But from where we are now in the foreground, you see the Jewish cemetery. This is where all the devout Jews want to be buried, they say, so that they can have a front row seat to the arrival of the Messiah in their mind, when the temple will be rebuilt. Uh, if you look over to the extreme uh, right edge of the picture, you'll see a, a church on the edge of the frame. That is literally the church where Jesus looked over the city and wept the last part of the Luke passage I read to you and it says that he wept for two reasons one because they failed to recognize his coming when God would visit their city they missed it and secondly because he is prophetically seeing in the future to 70 AD when this city will be destroyed when not a stone will be left upon the stone you can make out, if you look at the city, a wall. This is not the wall of Jesus' day. That, that was torn down completely. Um, this is a modern rebuild from the time of the Muslim occupation and the Crusades. But it's essentially the same size as ancient Jerusalem. And that building in the middle with the Golden Dome, that is now an Islamic mosque, but it's literally and intentionally built exactly on top of the site of the Jewish temple. So... This is the view that Jesus would have had coming down, seeing the temple, and directly uh, in front of it. This is the east side of the city. There's a set of gates which are now sealed by stones, but they were called the Golden Gate. This is the gate where Jesus entered the temple area, triumphantly on a donkey uh, as people laid down palm branches and garments for the donkey to walk upon. Uh, so that's the view. The, the passage is just loaded with scriptural references. There's no way that I could uh, give you an exhaustive list, but let me just highlight a few of them. Uh, amongst the things that the crowds are shouting, they are shouting passages of Psalm 118. Uh, Psalms 113 to 118 are called the Hallel Psalms. They are the Psalms directly associated with the Passover meal, that you would sing certain of these psalms between courses of the meal, including ones that would be sung as 
people headed out into the garden to reflect after the meal. Um, they also kind of collectively fulfill a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 62, in which he says, behold, your salvation comes, or more importantly, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where Zechariah writes, rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That has significance as well, because we're told from the script, this donkey has never been ridden, therefore it's appropriate for sacred use. And it's also symbolic of kingly coronations in uh, ancient Judaism. If the king were to ride in on a horse, it would signify war. But when the king rode in on a donkey, it was to signify peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, he comes to usher in an age of peace, uh, to reconcile us to God the Father, and uh, to die in atonement for our sins. So his mission is highlighted there. If you look at the four Gospels together, the language can be a bit confusing because it refers to a donkey and a colt, and it goes seemingly back and forth. Some people think that those are both just references to the same animal, that this donkey was a colt, a young donkey. Uh, other people think it's two animals, one of those being St. Jerome, who translated scripture. Uh, he said it's an allegory of two peoples that Jesus brought together in the Christian covenant. Uh, the donkey, he said, represented the Jewish people who came over to the Christian faith because they represent the root system of the tree of life. Um, and the colt, which is younger and not fully developed yet, he said represents the Gentiles who are still young and undeveloped in their faith. But ultimately, Jesus comes in a peaceful way and also a triumphal way. If you read First Kings um, about the coup attempt between Adonijah, half-brother of Solomon, uh, at the time of David's winding down of his life, um, David made clear that his intended heir would be Solomon, but while well, he's still alive, but not clear thinking, uh, Adonijah decides to appeal to one of the rebel generals and to one of the king's counselors and essentially to uh, follow after the example of his older brother who also tried to carry out a coup. Um, and Bathsheba, on behalf of Solomon, her son, she runs to David and explains the situation and he instructs uh, Solomon to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey to the temple to be anointed by Nathan the prophet and Zadok the high priest. And ultimately his kingship is the one that's recognized by the people. So it, it kind of thwarts an attempted coup uh, because of that. And uh, in this, Jesus is seen as a new kind of Solomon, uh, bringing a new wisdom, but in a royal way, bringing in a new dynasty or so the crowd thinks. Those are just some of the things packed into this story. There's a lot of deep imagery that comes from the royal age of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings of uh, that high time in Jewish history. But ultimately, we come to discover that this popularity, which is the apex of uh, crowd appeal that Jesus will ever achieve in his public ministry. It's extremely short-lived. In fact, it doesn't even last a week. It's a matter of days before the crowd turns on him and Jesus is put to the most painful and horrific and shameful deaths known to humanity at the time. To me, though we can um, make a lot of connections, connecting the dots with scriptural passages Ultimately, I always think of the feebleness of our nature, how short-lived is our commitment to the Lord sometimes, how easily sometimes we betray him. We praise him one moment and the next moment we return to our sin uh, in a state of betrayal, that, that we are just weak and sometimes we just lack spine. We lack determination and fortitude and the the strongest sign of that, I think, 
to me comes from our liturgy. And it's this, that I know that many of you know this detail. The palms we receive on Palm Sunday meant to signify our praise of our Lord. They are ultimately burned during the year after they dry up and their ashes are what produces the ashes that we use to repent from our sin on Ash Wednesday the following year. There is a link even in the plant material itself between our giving praise and our falling back into sin. Let's uh, be mindful of that, be vigilant of that, strive to be faithful. We ask God's grace to help us uh, break that pattern of sin uh, and to truly have the courage to recognize him as our king uh, in these days to give testimony that he is the Lord of our life. I hope you had a blessed Palm Sunday. Maybe that adds some more detail to what we celebrated. Tune in to our next video, which will take a little closer look at the Last Supper, the Passover meal prepared by the apostles.